by that fire, and that fire, it takes away the, the hay and the wood and the stubble and the things that are in the way that are blocking the view of you. And that fire, it exposes the gold and the silver and the precious gems and the things that remain. Tonight, Lord, I ask that you, the consuming fire, would come and refine us. Just keep your heads bowed. I just want to share something with you before we start tonight and stay in a, just a couple minutes of prayer. There are, there are two things that we face, and that is the circumstances that are in our lives. And then there is the state of our heart and our mind because of those circumstances. And often we pray that God will take the circumstances away. But sometimes those circumstances are the fire that God uses to refine us. And if you want to pray this prayer with me tonight, then you can say amen at the end. If you're not sure, then that's okay. But Father, I pray that you don't take the circumstances of our lives away if they are bringing forth something in our hearts that we need to become like you. And I want to pray, Jesus, that whatever it takes, we trust you to do whatever it takes, even if you have to refine us, to bring forth what you want to in our lives and to get rid of the things that you don't want there. Lord, our hearts can either become bitter, they can become angry or afraid or anxious, or our hearts can be strengthened and you can put, as you say, Lord, you will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. I ask that, Lord, you would do that work. Don't take our circumstances away if you want them there, Lord. Don't take the fire away, Lord, but would you guard our hearts and our minds? And could we be a people who, no matter what the circumstance is, we could be at peace, that the peace of God would guard our hearts and our minds. We trust you tonight, Lord. We trust ourselves into your hands because we believe that you're a good God. We love you, Lord. I ask right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, I'm nervous. I have a lot to say and I don't know how to say it. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I pray you'd come down upon this congregation tonight as you see a people who right now are just raising our hearts to you and saying, God, I don't just want to feel better. I don't just want to get comfortable. I want you to do something in my life. That's what we ask today. We ask you would be pleased to hear us say that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Open up with, with me, if you will, to the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 11. I believe that this is one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. And I am really glad to be able to be the one to, uh, to get to teach it um, just because I love it. I love this chapter. God has taken me through this chapter a few times. Um, the guys last night were all making fun of me because they said it's the easiest chapter because I didn't have to go through all these other theological things they had to go through, but whatever, okay, it's still hard. So um, here's why this chapter is important. Ch Hebrews chapter 11 gives us the key to having a good testimony. Basically, a good testimony is what they're going to say at your funeral, what they're going to write on your tombstone, but most importantly is what Jesus will say about you on Judgment Day. You're going to find out how to have a good testimony tonight. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us how to please God. And there's only one way to please God, and we're going to find that out. That's in this chapter. It actually tells us how to make God glad to be our God, to be represented by us, to have us as his ambassadors. It tells us how to do that. And it tells us how to have a great reward. We're going to talk tonight, this is 
this chapter is all about faith. And what I want to do is just dive into this word, faith, tonight and just go all around it. This chapter covers a lot of the Old Testament. And so it's, it's one that you do series for six and seven weeks on because you go into each person who's in these chapters. And so we're obviously not going to do that tonight. I'm just going to graze over the top of it and hopefully you'll get a hunger to, do, to, to look into it yourself and to, to begin to look up these different patriarchs and these different people and look up their stories. But what I want to do tonight is I want to talk about what faith is, what faith is not, what faith does, what faith doesn't do, how to get some faith, and then we'll go on, most importantly, how it works in our lives, and how to live by it. So let's just jump in right now to, um, to Hebrews chapter 11. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir, the heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. The first thing that it says here is that faith is substance and evidence. Some of us, be- some of us have a thought in our mind that faith is just kind of like, I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to jump out there. I'm not quite sure if it's there or not, but I'm just going to jump out and do it because I'm going to just try to please God. And it says here that faith is not that at all, that faith is substance and evidence. Actually, it says that by it, people, they, they obtained a good testimony. These are, all, these are all words that you might hear in a courtroom if you were trying to solve a case. What would you want? You would want substance. You would want evidence. You would want real tangible things that you could make real tangible decisions by. From them, you would get your testimony. You would say, I've seen this. I've held this. I've experienced this. Faith, the word faith, simply means what you are convinced of. It's what you believe. It is what you trust because you're totally persuaded and convinced about it. That's what faith is. Faith is substance and evidence. Faith and believe, those two words, they're the same word in the Greek. They're the same thing. Faith would kind of be the noun and believe would kind of be the verb, okay? Faith is what you believe. It is, it is all the substance and evidence. It's all of the things that you have put together. When you believe, it means that now you go forward because I absolutely believe that this is going to work because I have absolute conviction that this is going to work. Faith is a living thing. Faith is not something you just get and then you start to you just start to use it and you just keep the same measure of it. Faith can grow or shrink. This is all from the Bible, but I'm not going to give you every Bible verse. Faith can be great or little. It can be refined. It can be shipwrecked. It can be denied. Faith can be kept. It can fail. It can be made void. It can fill a person. It can be continued in. It can be weak in you or strong in you. It can be measured and proportionate. It can be increased. Faith can be destroyed. And not all men have faith, the Bible says. Faith can be departed from. Faith is the truth, the substance and the evidence that it leads to knowledge, which leads to trust, which leads to the actions that you take. 
what you believe about something will determine how you take action in that thing. Every one of us, faith isn't just a, a religious word. It's not just a Bible word. Every one of us has faith because we are convinced that our car will take us down the road and we get inside this big hunk of metal and we fly down the road 70 miles an hour. We're, we are convinced that those tires are going to work and that that thing's going to work and it takes us down the road. Faith is not all that spiritual of a word, but it is what we have and what God has given us to please Him. It is the means by which we please Him. And so tonight we're going to talk about, well, how do I get it, okay? But that's coming. I just want to define faith for you first of all. Because if you're just living saying, well, I mean, I think this Jesus thing is right and I'm just going to go for it because that's faith. It's not faith. And we're going to find that out because we're going to find out what faith is and what faith is not. When you understand what faith is about, that, I'm sorry, when you understand that faith is about what you are convinced of, you will understand the spiritual battle better. See, the enemy went after faith right away. In Genesis um, chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, it says this. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. First time we ever see the enemy in the Bible. He's right there, chapter 3. God, the first two chapters, God was creating it. Then the enemy shows up, and the first thing he says was, did God really say that? Did God really say that? Are you sure? He immediately went after what she was sure of. He immediately went after it, and he found, a little, he found a little chink in there. She said, oh, no, we shouldn't touch it. We shouldn't eat it nor touch it. And so she added a little something to it, right? God didn't say you couldn't touch it. I don't think they should have touched it, but he didn't say you shouldn't touch it. just said don't eat it. And so he found this little weakness, and he came in, and that was the first sin. That was the first time. It says in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 10, verse 4 through 5. It says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. What is the spiritual battle that's going on in our minds? It's all about what we believe. It's all about truth. It's arguments that come in and say, did God really say that? Is your God really like that? Arguments that come in, that, that, that come to your substance and your evidence, the things you know about God, and it begins to tap on those things and see if it can get you off of that foundation. What's the first thing as you, as you look at the, uh, the armor of God in spiritual battle? What's the first thing you put on? It is the belt of truth. Faith is all about what you believe to be true. It is what you are convinced of. That's what faith is. It's substance and evidence. And so right on top of that, we go now to the next thing, and that is what faith is not. Faith is not blind, and I've already said that. Let me just, let's just go through this a little bit. Let's just go back over a couple of these verses in Hebrews. And let's just look at what it says here. By faith, uh, in verse 7, let's go, to, let's go to Noah. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not seen, he moved with godly fear. Noah had a warning from God. God had spoken to Noah. Noah had blueprints for an ark. Noah knew how to make the ark. He knew what to do. God had spoken to Noah. He had substance and evidence. Now he had to go build an ark out in the middle of the desert in front of all of his friends. That's believe. That's where the action takes place and Noah goes out and builds an ark. That's where faith puts, that's where the feet get under faith and it starts moving forward. That's the difficult part of faith. That's where we stop often. 
Abraham had a calling. It said Abraham went out when he was called to go out to the place that he would receive as an inheritance. Sarah had a promise. Jacob had a prophecy. All of these people had a, a, a time when God gave them substance and evidence. He came to them and he gave them a reality of who he was. It was very, very clear. And then they had to move up on it. They had to move in belief upon that thing. So faith is not blind. But faith also is not knowing the end from the beginning. Look at verse 8. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place he would receive as an inheritance. So there's, Ab there's his calling. He's got substance and evidence which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Okay? So faith is not knowing the end from the beginning. Man, don't we always want to know, well, Lord, where are you taking me? He says, I'll give you, I'm going to give you a clear direction right now, but I'm not always going to tell you where you're going because we probably wouldn't go <laughs> if, we, if he, we found out where he was taking us most of the time. Okay? Faith is also not comfortable all the time. Okay? Look at verse 9. By faith... He dwelt in the land of promises in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Faith is not comfortable. He, Abraham dwelt in tents. When you follow God, sometimes you're going to end up, and we're going to see at the end of this chapter, it's going to get really bad with some of these people who followed God in faith. Okay? Their lives weren't great, but they had substance and evidence. They believed, they went forward on it, and they pleased God by doing that. Faith is not instant gratification. It's not a means to our own, our own ends, okay? Just like we said here, he waited for a, a city whose builder and maker is God. Chuck said something a, a few uh, Sundays back that I, I hung on to. And he said this, he said, Jesus wants you to be part of his life. And I thought that, I thought he kind of messed up, you know, in what he said. I thought he meant to say, Jesus wants to be part of your life. And then I stopped and I really pondered that and I realized, you know what? Jesus doesn't want to be part of my life. Jesus doesn't want to be part of your life. He wants you to be part of his life. He's the whole thing. He's not an app on your phone. He's not a place that you go on Sundays. Jesus is once, he wants you to be part of his life. He's the whole thing. And all of us right here are the body of Christ. And all together, when we're all doing what we do, we make up the body of Christ. He's the whole thing. He's the head. He's the one who's leading us. It's his kingdom. It's not about us. Faith is not always fulfilled in our lifetimes. Let's go down. Um, let's go down. Uh, let's just read on through, but we're going to get to verse 13. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength co to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand of the sea, which is by the seashore. All these died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Faith is not always fulfilled in your lifetime. It says these all died in faith, not having received the promises. One more thing I'm going to say before I keep going is that it's interesting that faith is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. And we'll, I think as we, as we progress on, we'll find out why it's not one of the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, it's not. You know, there's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all that. Faith isn't one of the fruits of the Spirit. Faithfulness is. But that's different than faith. And so it's interesting because faith, we're going to find, never stands by itself. And it's not the all-consuming one thing. It is, just, it is just the beginning of how we walk with God. 
when I see these things about what faith is not, I think it, it, it helps me to understand why the, the prosperity doctrine that you hear, that you might hear, as far as God wants you to receive your promise, claim your promise right now. God wants you to have it right now. I dare you to ask God to bless you. Okay, but let's talk about what your promise really is and what that blessing really looks like. Because as we go through faith, I believe God does want you to prosper. I think he does want you to want to bless you. But you know, it usually comes through a fire that's consuming everything around you that's not of him. It's often through dwelling in lands that you don't, that you don't know anything about. It's, it's going and taking steps out into places that you don't understand. It's about doing big things like bringing half a Uganda over here to sing in your church. It's about doing things that just completely are beyond you. Sure, God wants to bless you. Sure, he wants you to be prosperous. The prosperity doctrine, it's deceiving because it's someone who's telling you what God's plan for you is. And that person... For one, if that plan isn't specifically laid out in the Bible and very much of the things that we're praying for in these claiming it for ourselves and claiming these things and go get your promise, they're usually not biblical. And how does the guy on TV know what it is that God wants to specifically do in your life? How does the guy who's telling you to go get your promise know even what your promise is? And how are you going to get that by sending money to him? That's where we have to watch out because people are trying to merchandise us. They're trying to use us as merchandise. They're trying to make the, the Christianity thing seem like something you could almost pay for. And that this Christianity thing is going to give you everything that you need right here and now. But faith does not lead us to that if we look at this chapter, which is the chapter of faith. So let's just keep on going. What is what faith does? Because faith is substance and evidence, it gives us the confidence and the assurance that we have to make life-changing and generation-changing and world-changing and eternity-changing decisions. If I told you that right under this section right here, somebody had buried uh, a big pot of gold, a long time ago, some pirates, you know, they, they brought it here and they, they buried it here and they covered it up with cement. You go, yeah, that's great. But then what if somebody showed you a map? And then what if you started reading the history books and you started tracing them right down to Date Palm and all of a sudden they went right in those doors there. And what if all these things started coming together and you started realizing, whoa, that's, there is some treasure under there. It would be kind of funny for somebody else who didn't see that with you to come walk in here and they see that you've got a, a, a knife to cut carpet and a jackhammer in your hand and you're standing in the middle of the church and all the chairs are peeled out. They think, what a crazy guy, right? But you've got some substance and evidence that tells you, you know what, there's some treasure under there. So now you're doing something that looks crazy to people. Now you're building an ark out in the middle of the desert. Now you're leaving this great, wonderful land to go out to a land called Ur like Abraham did. Go out to some place and dwell in tents where you used to be a rich man and everybody knew you. Faith gives us the confidence and the assurance to do crazy things, the crazy things that God is asking us to do. Faith removes doubt about the truth. It removes doubt about God's will. Look at verse 13 again. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having, rece having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Right here in those verses, it says that faith, it, it sets our eyes on the right things. It turns our focus to things in the future. It turns our focus to heaven. 
It turns our focus to the rewards that God has for us. It turns our focus even to Jesus himself. Next week when we start, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by all of these people, let us what? Let us run the race with endurance that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What faith does is it takes your eyes and it gets them off of the things on this world and it focuses them onto the future. It focuses them onto a homeland where moth and rust don't destroy. It, it, and Jesus was always doing this. Jesus was homeless. Jesus was not trying to make everything here right. He was trying to get a people who would focus their mind and their hearts upon that homeland that was to come. And those ones, it says here, it says God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. That's amazing. Let's go on down and it says in verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. He who had, um, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. You guys remember Abraham taking Isaac up onto the hill, and he was going to sacrifice Isaac there. God had told him to sacrifice his own son there. And there's some little clues, but um, Paul, or whoever wrote Hebrews, comes out with it right here. There's some little clues when, when Abraham says, the boy and I are going up on the mountain, and we're going to worship, and we'll be back. There's some clues that Abraham knew God was somehow either going to save Isaac from this, but it says right here, God would even raise him from the dead if he had to. Abraham had so much substance and evidence, he had concluded because of what he believed in his heart about God, he had concluded in verse 19 that God was able to raise him up from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What he keeps doing, he's calling Abraham an old man here, is what he keeps doing. He's trying to be nice about it, but he's really not. He's saying Abraham was dead as a doornail as far as it came, when it came to having kids. He was 100 years old. And his wife, um, I, often they'll say she was well advanced in years, which was a really nice way to say that. She was old too. And so the, he keeps trying to say, look, Abraham received his son from the dead in a figurative sense, because how does a 100-year-old guy get a baby going, right? It happened. Now, there's Isaac, all right? By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave constructions concerning his bones. If you just look at each of those things, how do you prophesy over all your kids unless God's given you something to prophesy? These guys prophesied over their children because God had given them something to say. They had substance and evidence. So by faith, they came out and they spoke. Here's Joseph, 400 years before Moses would take them out and take them across the Red Sea. And here's Moses, or I'm sorry, here's, I'm sorry, Joseph, 400 years before Moses. And he said, hey guys, when you guys leave here, because you're going to, take my bones with you. I'm not going to be around. But take my bones with you out into the promised land. They don't belong here in Egypt. All of these people had God speaking to them. God had spoken to them. They had substance and evidence. So as we go down, we say in verse 23, it says this, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Faith focuses on the future, but here you see that faith also helps us to forsake sin. It helps us to walk away from sin. Why is that? Because when you get a taste of who God is, when you get some substance and evidence, when you've tasted and seen that he is good, Sin doesn't have a good flavor anymore. When you, get a, when you get an understanding that there is heaven coming, that there is a place where we will dwell, where there will never be any more sorrow or suffering, it'll be the greatest place you could imagine. It's right in the, the end of the Bible. You can read all about it. 
and God wipes away every tear, when you know and you have the hope of that that's coming, then you're going to forsake the things on this world because your mind and your heart is focused there. Sin doesn't have a flavor anymore for you. It's tempting still because you've got this, this traitor living inside of you that just wants a, a, a pleasure. But it, that, that, that flesh is crucified. It's put on the cross. It's totally laid down when we turn our eyes upon Jesus. It says, the Bible says it like this. It says, he who walks in the spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because as we walk with God, he focuses our mind upon the future, upon things that are coming. And it changes the way we live here. But it also helps us to forsake sin because there's nothing we're holding on to here anymore. There's nothing we're trying to get here anymore. Verses 27 through 29. It says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. We're talking about what faith does. Faith results in action, but not activity. There is a difference. If you're just trying to go out and do something for God and trying to make something happen all the time, you're not walking in faith if God hasn't asked you to do that. If you, if you from his word or from your quiet time with him, do not have an, an understanding and substance and evidence that what I'm doing is what God wants me to do, then you're just, you're just active. You're just doing activities but you're not taking action based on the substance and evidence that God's given you to do. God didn't call Abraham to go build an ark. He didn't call Noah to leave and go to Ur. He called Sarah to have a baby when she was really old, but he didn't call these other ladies to have a baby when they were really old. These things are so unique. He called Joseph down into Egypt. He called all these different people in different ways that led to action, but they weren't just doing activity. You can see it in the Bible when people tried to just get something going and just tried to do activity, and it usually didn't bear any fruit. Um, one, one that I think is a great one was when Jesus said, go up into the, Jesus said, go, we, we, right before he left, he said, go into the upper room and wait and don't do anything and wait until the Holy Spirit comes down. And when he falls on you, you'll have great power and I'll do great things th- for you, right? I'll do great things through you. So they're up there, they're waiting. Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. Nothing's happened. Well, let's pick an, why don't we pick a, an, an apostle? You know, Judas is gone. Why, let's pick an apostle. So they, they roll the dice and try to figure out who the next apostle is going to be. And, and so they get Matthias. You never see him again in the Bible. I don't know what happened to this guy. I don't know what happened with him. But all I know is I think Paul probably was that 12th disciple. If they had to have 12. But they just, it was like they just needed to do something. It was like when they were up on the mountain and Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. And Moses and Elijah come and they're talking and God says, this is my beloved son. And Peter wants to start building, you know, little shacks for everyone to live in up there on top of the mountain. He just wants to be busy, right? He's just trying to get active. But Jesus, it says in there, it says he didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> it says that right there in the word. Are you running around trying to do something for God without any sense of what he really wants you to do? Are you just seeing needs and saying, I have to fill those needs? Man, Aaron and Brianna are leaving the church. They did like 95% of the ministries in this church. It's like, this is going to be a big empty building, right? And so the rest of us are like, okay, what do I do? Um, I know how to play the piano. Okay, yeah, I can make coffee. Um, well, let's see. I, I like kids, kind of. You know, and we're trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out what we're supposed to do, right? And we're all trying to get active here. Last night, I, we were just praying with Pastor Chuck, and it was wonderful. He said, we're not doing anything until God tells us what to do. We're just going to pray. I want to tell you something right now, that you are in a place, in a church right now, where the leadership just wants to pray until God moves. That is exciting. I am excited to be part of that kind of a church where we're going to pray until God tells us what to do. We're not going to just try to be Aaron and Brianna because we can't. We're not going to try to fill all these places that where people aren't anymore. We're not going to try to fill all these seats up just with warm bodies. We're not going to do that. We're just going to pray as God's people 
until he tells us what to do. Now that's faith. That takes faith. But that's the word that God gave Chuck and it was confirmed by a whole bunch of other guys who said the same thing. Yeah, we're not supposed to do anything. We're supposed to pray. That's, that's exciting. You're in a good place. Okay, what faith does not do? I'm going to just stop and I'm just going to kind of con- comment before we continue through the passage. Because I just want to talk a little bit about what faith does not do. And, it's, and, and then we'll get into it. We'll get into some of these verses here and show some of that. But the, the only way I could explain what faith is, faith is kind of like flour. You know, you use flour to bake all kinds of things, sweet things and, and dinner and, and all kinds of different things are made. Flour is the base for those. You, even macaroni and cheese, the sauce for that. Flour is the base in that. But flour by itself is tasteless. It just kind of leaves you dry. You can't eat it by itself. You've got to mix it with something else. And that's, that's how I want you to see faith. Faith is, the, is what God has given you, but if you've just got that, if you've just got the Word of God which brings faith, if you've just got some word that maybe God has, 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 has given you to do, maybe, you, maybe He's given you something to say to somebody else, if that is not mixed with something else, it'll be dry and it be tasteless, and it won't work. Let me just give some examples. Faith without love is nothing. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. Faith without works is dead. Faith without truth, it leads to false doctrine and the loss of focus. Like we were talking about with the, with the prosperity teaching and, and some of that, that world of, the, of you know, if it's faith without truth and it just takes a little thing here and there, it can lead you into false doctrine and lead you out of focus, okay? Faith without grace and mercy is harsh. It says in Ephesians 4, it says, speaking the truth in love, we build each other up. If faith does not have mercy and truth along, have you ever known somebody who had a lot of faith but they didn't have a lot of mercy? especially for people who didn't have faith around them. You ever been around those kind of people? You know, you're like, okay, you know, I, I understand that you believe this, and I really do, that, do believe they believe it, but there's just no love. There's no, tr- there's no mercy. There's no coming alongside of you. They've just got faith. Faith without obedience leads to false hope. And I want to just, um, I want to turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. This is a, these are some pretty scary verses, but I, I want to just give you an idea of what faith does not do. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Um, I th- and I think we've got it up on the, on the board. I'm not sure. Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven... Many will say to me in that day, I figure he's talking about judgment day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I, Jesus, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's a scary verse. You know why? Because it doesn't say, Lord, did we not walk people across the street? And Lord, did we not give to the Salvation Army? And Lord, did we not? No. It says they prophesied. That takes faith. It says they cast out demons. That takes faith. You don't do that without faith. You don't do that without the power of God. These are people who worked in the power of God. They had great faith, but they were disobedient. Faith without obedience leads to a false hope and a false sense that we're doing things right. That, man, I'm God's man because I can go and lay my hands on people and they get healed. Guys, I believe that the power of God does move through different people. But it doesn't imply that that person is right with God. You see that throughout the Bible. And so that's the next, that's the next um, place I want to go is that faith does not produce or imply that a person has character. Let's just read verse 30 through 34 back in Hebrews. 
This is an important thing to understand because it'll help you to understand sometimes what you're seeing out there in the world. You're thinking, man, there's power there, but something's missing. Something doesn't reside in my heart. Something doesn't resound in me when I see that. I'm, I can't get, I, I like what I'm seeing as far as people getting healed and all kinds of things happening, but there's something wrong with the way they keep hitting me for money. Or there, there's something wrong with the attitude of the way that that person is ministering to the people. That's because faith does not imply that a person has character. Let's read verse 30. It says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe but she, um, when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms and worked righteousness and obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions and quenched the violence of fire and escaped the edge of the sword and out of weakness were made strong became valiant in battle and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. You may not know all of those, all of those guys in there, but anyone, any of us who have been to Sunday school know who Samson is, right? Samson is a great example of someone who had faith without character. He's a great example of faith because he did a lot of great things, but that faith, you don't want to follow Samson's example, only that he believed God. That's it. And then leave him there. Leave him there with Delilah and everything else, okay? Samson was faith without self-control. Gideon and Barak would have been faith without courage or humility. Jephthah would be faith without discernment. Read that story. David and Samuel would be faith without family values. And lastly, faith does not always result in physical victory. And we've been through this, but let's finish the chapter with that. In verse 35, it says, Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy." They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Faith does not always result in us winning the physical battle in the end. These people were stoned in faith. They were sawn in two in faith. They were tempted and slain with the sword in faith. They wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins. skins. They were destitute, afflicted, tormented. If someone's going to tell you that this life is where it's all at, they can't read these verses to you when they're talking about faith. These are the people who God said the world was not even worthy to have them in it. That to me is amazing. That to me is amazing. I don't want us to come to a place where we believe God is just all the things that feel good, but that we believe the whole package of who God is. We believe the whole package of who God is. Do you believe that God would allow his people to be tortured and imprisoned and stoned to death? It's right here. Have you read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Have you read the Voice of the Martyrs right now that comes out every month? Churches being burned down, persecution, fire, difficult times. And here's why, because when those times come, the Bible says that it's going to get so evil on the earth that many will turn away from God. The love of many will grow cold and they will turn away from God. And I think that's because they didn't have the whole package of who God is. Their focus was on the, on the world. Someone told them that your life can be perfect here if you just trust God and have faith. 
and they never told them about persecution or difficulty. But I will tell you this, like we started tonight, no matter what your circumstances are here, you can always have peace, you can always have hope, you can always have joy, you can always have love. Those are non-negotiables. You can always have those things. Because these are not about the circumstances or the fire. These are about what's going on inside of your heart. And most of us are struggling in our heart. We're not struggling so much in our circumstances. We're struggling with God. You know God doesn't believe in atheists any more than atheists don't believe in God. Romans 1 clearly says that, the, that God doesn't believe you when you say that there was no God. It says there's no excuse. I've shown you. Hebrews talks about people walking away from faith. Who were those people who walked away from faith? Those who walked around in the desert and saw his works for 40 years. See, faith, substance, evidence, it has to land on a heart that's ready. Because the hardened heart is hard indeed. As seen by Jesus himself, healing the blind and raising the dead, the hearts never changed. People still didn't believe in him. He was up on the cross, and they said, come down from the cross, and then we'll believe you. Oh, really? After I walked on the water, after all the people I healed, after all the blind eyes, if I just jump off the cross here, you'll believe me. No, the heart is so hard. It just wants to see something, but it's not going to help anything. Our hearts have to come to a place that we say, Lord, I believe you. I believe that you're real, and I believe that you love me. And you have to come to the place like Sarah did back in verse 11. It says, by faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. She bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful. How are you judging God tonight? I mean, really, how do you judge him? How do you look at God? When you, when, when you judge who God is and you say in your heart about who God is, what do you say in there? Do you understand him perfectly? Can you understand his judgments? Can you explain those to other people? I can't. I mean, if I really look at God, I would say, Lord, why do you let Things happen to children that shouldn't happen to children. Why do you let that happen? And I feel like he's too soft on sin right now. And then I read the end of the Bible, and I see that he throws a whole bunch of people into hell for all of eternity. And they burn for all of eternity. And I say, Lord, that's pretty harsh. So he's too soft on sin over here, and then he's too hard on it over here. Maybe I should just let God be God. Maybe I should quit trying to figure it out and trying to explain it to everybody because I don't know. But maybe I should just judge him in my heart as faithful and completely commit myself because he's shown us, he's given us substance and evidence. Okay, so how do we get the faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. That's how you get it. That word, word, actually means it's the word rhema and it means really what god is saying to you here in the moment but obviously this is where your faith builds it's the word of god and if you get into this and you stay in it that's where your faith grows and then this begins to connect with your heart and then god begins to speak to you about your ark or about your little baby, or about your leaving and going somewhere else, and whatever that is, and you get your substance and evidence, and you, grow, and you go forward with that. I want to lead you in a, in a prayer before we, before we close. I know I'm a little bit late, and I, I'm sorry I've gone long. But I just want to end with a prayer, and it's Psalm verse, uh, chapter 139, verse 23 through 24. Let's just bow our heads. Psalm chapter 139, verse 23 through 24 says this. Search me and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me. Would you say tonight, dear Lord, 
I am wide open. You can search me. I'm transparent. I'm wide open. Know my heart. There's no hidden place. Lord, you see the bitterness. You see the hurt from the past. You see my questions. You see it all. Know my heart, Lord. Search me and know my heart. Try me. Lord, would you refine me? Would you try me? Would you find my weak points and strengthen them? Would you find the things that are causing me to stumble? And would you remove them? Would you try me like gold is tried and refined? And see if there be any wicked way in me. Lord, is there some place in my life that is hindering me and keeping my heart hard? Is there a wicked way in me? Lord, I'm wide open. I'm wide open. I'm transparent. Would you look in there, Lord? Just let God look into your heart right now. And lead me in the way everlasting.